Good evening. How's everyone doing tonight? I think it was sent well just a minute or two ago. If that did not fire you up, then your wood is more than wet. There's something seriously going on because a tremendous opening address by Pastor Tom Ford. And certainly for myself, I was sitting there thinking about my, uh, my notes for this next session and wondering whether I'm really going to hit the pitch that, uh, that Tom set for us. So it's a delight to be here. I'm very pleased from Ascension Church, home church here in Brisbane. Thank you. Yep, and that's what it's like every Sunday, just two of us, so uh, pray, pray for us, and uh, I don't think I'm, is this alright? It's alright. I don't think I'm overstepping the mark to say I can also bring greetings from Haddon Institute, which of course is, uh, is where I'm lecturing as well, so who's, who's been through a Haddon program? Let's put your hand up. Alright, quite a few, quite a few. For the rest of you, you're our target this weekend, we've got to get you enrolled, so God is good. I think I'm making a mess of my microphone here. Where's Luca? You sure? All right. It's not good. <laughs> come on, man. Come, come help us out here. Where is he? Can you hear you see anything? I can't see a thing. Here we go. I think my lady got stuck. Sorry, bro. You know me. I just need to make a scene. I'm just that attention... Uh, Deficit. I see. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Luca. Yeah. yeah. All right. So I've been assigned the task to talk a little bit about uh, this evening revival. What is revival? Revival is one of those curious topics, not just broad evangelicalism, but Christianity largely that. It really doesn't get a lot of, uh, a lot of attention in its, in its definition. When people talk about revival, they tend to mean a bunch of different things. So when the Puritans would talk about revival, they would often just use the word reform. So some of you would know Richard Baxter's famous treatise on the reformed pastor. Uh, J.I. Packer did some great work on Baxter and said, when you see that title, you should really just think, the revival pastor, when, when Baxter arrived at the, the small English country town of Kidderminster and he preached the gospel there as a as new inductee of the pastor of the town, he said there was only one of two homes that he had any confidence that there were genuine converts. And after Baxter had labored there for a number of years, he said that he could very confidently state that the not just the majority but that just about every single citizen, nearly 2,000 people, had come to faith under the proclamation of Christ in his ministry. The Puritans were emphatic on revival, but they would often use the term reformed or, or reformation, whereas today we sort of use reformed in a, in a bit of a different way. We think Calvinistic, five points. We think, uh, we, we, we think confessions like LBC or, or Westminster. So tonight we're going to... We're going to go to the scripture. We're going to study God's word together. It's not going to be a directly expositional message, more of a case study in revival. Now, if I polled the crowd tonight or I threw out the question as, a, as something of a, maybe a cold open and I said, I said, volunteer for me, what region, what area of the world today has experienced the most spectacular revival in history? I suspect that there would be people volunteering Wales. It's known as the land of revivals. People would talk about maybe New England under the, the first Great Awakening or even upstate New York in the second Great Awakening. There are many parts of the world that have been smiled upon by God in His sovereignty to grant the fire a revival. But what if I suggested to you that the place, I, I, I make this proposal, the place in the world today that has experienced perhaps the most spectacular revival of all time throughout all human history is Iraq. Iraq. I wonder if that resonates at all. I wonder if there's anyone here that says, oh, that's, a, well, that's exactly what I was thinking. That's certainly where, where my mind went. That's where my head was at. We're going to take a look at the world's greatest it's my proposal, the world's greatest revival in Iraq, or as it was known in contemporary times, Nineveh. Nineveh, the capital city of this immense sprawling empire of Assyria. So we get to do a little bit of 
history tonight. We're going into the, the annals of the Old Testament to study the concatenation of nations and kings and queens and, and prophets and revivals and ultimately bringing glory to Yahweh, the God of Israel. Our story will be centering around the most recalcitrant missionary that ever there was. His name was Jonah. I don't know about you, I love reading missionary biography. I return to the lives of Adoniram Judson and William Carey and Hudson Taylor pretty much annually. I I will read the the most robust biographies on the lives of these wonderful missionaries as often as I can get my hands upon them. But the most disappointing, frustrating, demoralizing missionary biography ever written is, is Jonah. Is Jonah. You never met a guy that was most resistant to follow the call of God to go to a foreign nation and declare the truth of God that God might smile upon that nation. And in fact, Jonah tells us, Jonah tells us in his own little story, in his, in his book in the Old Testament, he said, God, I was reluctant to go because I know you to be a gracious God. I know you to be a merciful God and you were going to smile upon these Ninevites. And that's the last thing I wanted. You don't read that, funnily enough, in the lives of William Carey or Hudson Taylor or Adoniram Judson. What's going on in the story and the life of Jonah? King Jeroboam II reigned somewhere around about 781 BC to 753. Two centuries after King Solomon, to give it some chronological context. Now Israel falls, that's the northern kingdom in 722. Nineveh falls, that's the capital of Assyria, in 612. And Judah and Jerusalem are swept away in the Babylonian exile in 597 BC. Now you should note this, we're not going backward in time. right? Just, just to be really clear, I know that not everyone studies history, and that's, that's totally fine. There must be something wrong with you. I don't know why anyone doesn't love history, right? But I've learned that there are some that don't love it. And when you go B.C., you are counting down, not up, as you spread further from the life of Christ. So, so even though you look at these numbers, they are descending. We are getting further and further into the future. Let me give you this word from Habakkuk. I've seen different phrases and iterations of this on the promotional material. And even here tonight, Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 2 says this. And my dear friends in the Bible, about Habakkuk, Habakkuk 3 2 says this. O Lord, I have heard the report of you and your work. O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. Let me offer you uh, somewhat uh, an add-on to Pastor Tom's offering earlier on. A functioning definition of when I say revival and I think there's, a, there's something of a consensus among the speakers across this, this weekend. Let me give you something of a, a functioning definition. Revival is a sovereign outpouring of the Spirit en masse. So when one person gets converted, we, we don't call it revival. It is something akin to revival. There, there's an analogy in that. But revival is something spectacular. The, the, the early Americans, the colonial Americans, like to call it an awakening. It was something substantive and and even numerically significant. So the Spirit poured out sovereignly en masse. His presence and His power are coming in a special way that causes believers to be struck anew with a profound sense of divine things and unbelievers struck with a vivid realization of their destitution outside of Christ and they are compelled by supernatural power to cling to Jesus and are swept into the kingdom. Who doesn't want that? Well, Christian wouldn't want that. Now what seems to be the fastest recorded revival ever, among possibly the most unlikely people ever, By the most bizarre means ever is the Nineveh revival under the reluctant preaching of Jonah where 120 plus thousand people are converted in what seems to be overnight from a five word sermon preached in the wrong language. 
Jonah is a perplexing story. One of those curious stories where no of the credit, none of the glory or any of the renown goes to Jonah. He is honest, he is brutal, he is candid. Let's give the backstory. The rise of the Assyrians was an imminent threat to the divided kingdom of Israel. At this point in Old Testament history, the northern kingdom Israel and the southern kingdom Judah were fiercely at odds and divided. And the northern kingdom had its centralized governmental power in Samaria and the southern kingdom had retained the Temple Mount and the city of Jerusalem. Furthermore, Israel has been enjoying quite a time of prosperity and economic growth. This seemed to callous them against the words of several prophets who God sent among them to warn them of his displeasure and the ensuing judgment lest they repent. And the promise from God through the prophets is if you don't repent, turn back to God, maintain covenant faithfulness, then the land will spew you out. It'll reject you. You'll be cast into exile. And by the time Jonah comes on the scene, by the time he arrives, some of the Old Testament's most famous prophets had come and gone and had given strict and solemn warnings. Jonah's contemporaries were already announcing coming inevitable doom. Two of the most famous prophetic Contemporaries of Jonah were Hosea, and you know him because he was called of God to to marry a harlot, and Amos. And both of these prophets, with varying degrees of, of clarity or explicitly, declared that the northern kingdom will be judged by God. It's inevitable. It's a fait accompli. It is set in stone. The decree of God has, has been mandated, and it will be Assyria. In fact, Hosea goes as far as to explicitly say so. I'll give you uh, this particular verse from Hosea 9 verse 3. Hosea says this, They will not stay in the land of the Lord. Instead, Ephraim, it's a synonym for Israel, Ephraim will return to Egypt and they will eat unclean food in Assyria. Now this is staggering. Jonah has already made his name known in the courts of the kings of Israel. 2 Kings 14.25 says he was the one who restored the boundaries, or the king, Jeroboam II, restored the boundaries of Israel. And this was in accordance with the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, spoken through his prophet Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet from Gath-Hefer. And lock that in your mind. That geographic locale, a place of No renown, no fame, nothing significant, except it gave rise to the prophet Jonah, this location, the outskirts of the northern kingdom, Gath Hepha. And the commission comes to Jonah. Now make no mistake about it, Jonah is not just a guy with a bad attitude. I, I, know, I know you've seen VBS programs on Jonah, Sunday school messages. You've seen the VeggieTales episode. I don't know what you've seen, right? I don't know how scarred you might be, right? I don't, I don't know. But, but I will say this is that for the most part, Jonah just gets represented as this recalcitrant, like, like probably really racist, almost certainly, right? And, and super angry. And he's so, he's so proud of God's calling him to serve in the courts of the king of Israel. And now he's being sent, get up Jonah, go to the land of Nineveh and proclaim the word of the Lord. And you know the story. You know at least the bare bones of the story. Jonah bails, goes the opposite direction, jumps on a ship, tries to, to cross the Mediterranean Sea to get out to as far as Spain, And God sends this immense storm. There's something interesting about the storm. Don't ever read the story of Jonah without seeing something significant in the storm. There's, of course, something deeply supernatural. So much so that the pagan crew that were on the ship that were attempting to get Jonah to his furthest regions out of the reach of so-called the omnipresent hand of God, that they all converted The revival at Nineveh is not the first revival in the book of Jonah. So as we've said, Jonah has heard and received these prophecies. 
Jonah, of course, they throw him overboard. Jonah begs the crew, right? I'm the reason for this chaos. I'm the reason that we're all going to die. Throw me overboard. Now, they, they initially refuse. Again, you probably know the story. They start rowing hard into the wind against the waves. It comes to a point where it's very, very obvious they're all going to die unless they cast Jonah into the sea and they are saved. And, of course, once Jonah is cast overboard, the storm quells. The crew convert. They make sacrifice and proclaim the name of the Lord. And Jonah is swallowed by a large fish. Jonah is spat up. He repents. He calls out to the Lord. He says, salvation belongs to the Lord. He's spat out on dry ground. What does Jonah do? Now, I know you wanted to answer. He goes to Nineveh, but that's not what the story says. Jonah goes home. Right? What an ordeal. God, I've learned my... You ever been there with the Lord, right? I've learned my lesson. I'm not going to do the thing. But the punishment certainly was sufficient, God. I'm I'm humbled. I'm repentant. Jonah goes home. So chapter 4, verse 1 to 2 in Jonah quite literally says this. Jonah was greatly... Sorry, go back to chapter 3. I'm already taking you too far into the text this evening. Jonah chapter 3 verse 1, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city. Call out against it the message I tell you. What's interesting about the book of Jonah is every single chapter that you start reading has something quite shocking about it. You get to the end of chapter 2, and you probably would be mistaken from assuming that Jonah learned his lesson. He was desperately humble. He was swallowed by this fish. He was vomited out. It's a tremendous miracle of survival, and he is contrite. He is repentant. But he doesn't go to Nineveh. He goes home. And the word of the Lord has to come to Jonah the second time, issuing this command, leveling this commission. Verse 3 of chapter 3, So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Now someone in the ancient world could quite easily, a fit person, could quite easily walk 80 to 90 kilometers in a day. Three days' length is not someone walking at my pace, I will openly confess. If I get a K in me a day, I am, that's a miracle of, of modern medicine, right? But in the ancient world, three days' walk was a, was a large, sprawling metropolis. Jonah began to go into the city. He's just started. He goes a day's journey, so he walks one day to kind of get near to the, the center of the metropolis. And he calls out, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now in Hebrew, it's five words. A little more in English. That's the way Hebrew to English normally, normally trades. But these guys didn't speak Hebrew. They spoke an Arcadian language. It had, it had some relationship to ancient Hebrew, but it was just this rambling prophet of Israel turning up in their city in the jewel of the crown of the Assyrian Empire and declaring destruction. And verse 5 says, And the people of Nineveh believed God. Now, if you could, by some miracle of God's grace, if you could be transported back to that moment in that point in time and on that location and see this, I promise you, you would collapse on your face and say, great is our God. Nineveh was among the most cruel, pernicious, wicked, horrifically immoral, idolatrous city that had ever existed in the history of human existence. Nineveh are unlikely subjects of mercy. In fact, about a hundred years later, Nineveh gets another prophet. I'm not going to test the crowd, but if someone yelled it out, I'd be delighted. Very good. Thank you. A plus for whoever that student is. Nahum, the rest of you enroll at Haddon Institute. Come on. Nahum, another prophet of Israel. And when you read the the chapters of Nahum, I don't think I've ever read Nahum without my skin crawling with the description and the graphic nature of God's judgment. You know what God says to the Ninevites through Nahum? God says, I will judge you. I will pursue you even into darkness. 
I don't, I don't know about you, but you can pick any enemy in the world for me. Attila the Hun, Genghis Khan, Adolf Hitler. I do not want to be odds with, at, at odds with the God that can hunt me even into death. That's what Nahum says. These Assyrians were the most graphic in their idolatry and immorality. In fact, Nahum says this. He says, because of your lies, your rape, your sorcery, you prey on thousands, you slain tens of thousands, your harlotry, your witchcraft, and the seduction of all the nations at your hand. That's the Ninevites. That's the revival among the Ninevites. And Jonah turns up. He saunters a day's length into the city. He proclaims this five-word sermon. Certainly we can all admit, a sermon that's not at all calculated to optimistic results. Can we admit that? Right? Jonah's not there with the, with the winsomeness or the craftiness or the, or the Spirit's anointing like a, an Adoniram Judson, a Hudson Taylor, a, a William Carey. He's not a missionary trying to, trying to calibrate his message to engineer a gospel response. Jonah says, you're all doomed, 40 days, I'm happy to hear it, don't know what you're going to do, good luck, I'm out of here. And he bailed. He bailed. It seems that even when he bailed the city, he had some faint hope that God would bring this condemnation. But of course, what happens to Nineveh, the story is well known. Verse 5, I already started reading it. Let's complete the verse. And they, the people of Nineveh, believed God. They called for a fast. They put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least. And the word reached the king. The king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself in sackcloth, sat in ashes, and he issued a proclamation and published throughout the city by the decree of the king and his nobles. Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them feed or drink water. Let them not feed or drink water. Let man nor beast be covered. Let them be covered in sackcloth. Let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent. Turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. You know, many have questioned the revival in Nineveh. Is it genuine? Is it real? Could it, could it not just be more easily explained? Like, are you not introducing more variables to presume that it's some spiritual awakening? Couldn't you just say the Ninevites were kind of, they were kind of scared straight, right? They, 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 they were shocked into some kind of moral re- renovation. Isn't that, isn't that what's happening here? Should we wait? I don't know. What, is that the sound of rushing mighty wind? I'm not sure. May the Lord grant it. I'm sure it's just a, just a train. Many have questioned this revival. Could this really be a move of God? In fact, when I was studying at master's level, I, I wrote a defense, a thesis on this very question. Can we demonstrate that the revival in Nineveh was true revival? Or do we have to be satisfied with the assumptions of skeptics that it's nothing more than just these pagans were brought to a place of contrition out of fear? Let me give you a couple of reasons. Why? I believe this is as spirit-wrought move of God as any other revival that God has ever granted to bring these Ninevites not just into a, into a remedial state of behavior and attitude, but in fact into true spirit-born conversion. Now firstly, there's already many miracles in the story that, that largely go unaccounted for if the revival itself is not miraculous. Firstly, why would they believe Jonah? Why would they? Assyria was the biggest economy, fastest growing superpower in the entire region, almost the greatest superpower the world had seen up until that point. They were proud, haughty, uncaring, callous, without any thought of vulnerability. Jonah's message, unless empowered by the Holy Spirit, has no effect except probably to get Jonah killed. Jonah was there disturbing the public peace. And ancient civilizations largely believed that their strength and their growth was a sign of their God's superiority over the other gods of lesser nations in the region. And this was the the beating heart, Nineveh, 
the beating heart of the vast Assyrian Empire. They were not ready to acknowledge this solo street preacher who didn't have enough care to learn their language from a lesser race pontificate about his deity. Let me say this. I am, I'm going to shock you all with this, I'm reformed. Gasp, I'm ca- proudly Calvinistic, Right? So I believe that salvation is thoroughly a work of God. I believe we contribute nothing to our salvation except the sin that makes it necessary. That's that's a hat tip to Jonathan Edwards. I believe salvation from start to end is entirely a work of grace or glory to God. I am a solar kind of guy. But I want to say this to the skeptics. That look at the Jonah story and then conclude... There's nothing supernatural in the revival. And say, if the entire capital of Assyria bowed their knee and humbled themselves, even the king before Jonah, that to me seems like you are importing a pretty significant miracle on your own. And you don't have God to explain it. Because you're a skeptic. These Assyrians would never have paid heed. And yet the entire city more than 120,000 souls are brought to a place of desperate contrition. And that's my next argument. This revival touches every corner, every level, every compartment of society. It is exhaustive, thoroughgoing, and comprehensive. In Jonah 3.5, we read this a minute ago, it says, from the greatest of them to the least of them, even the king." was dramatically moved and brought down from his throne. Royal robes cast off, sackcloth, like Hessian sack bag, sitting in ashes and dust, pleading to the God of Israel to have mercy. Those two first arguments, I think, have some weight, but I can't conclude my case without going to Jesus. You know why I know that the Nineveh revival was a spirit-wrought converting revival? Do you know how I am so confident that these Ninevites that heeded the preaching of Jonah are in heaven right now surrounding the throne of Christ, worshipping with songs to the Lamb, is because Jesus said so. Let me give you Matthew 12, 39 to 41. Hear the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Jesus said, and I, sorry, let me start again. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. But no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Verse 41. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. It's very, it, it, it's impo- I was going to say it's unlikely. That's understated. It's impossible for me to concede that what Jesus is saying is that when the great books are opened and judgment is meted out with finality and conclusiveness, that the men of Nineveh shall rise up at the generations of unbelievers in Jesus' day and say, at least we gave our repentance a bit of a more thoroughgoing attempt. We're all going to hell, right? That's what happens here because we're Ninevites and, and you are pagans that crucified Jesus. But at least we made a better attempt. No, Jesus says they're going to be brought into the courtroom to give testimony. Why did you not repent when a greater than Jonah is here? The word of God, through the most recalcitrant prophet there is, Jonah, the most reluctant, disinterested, Jonah is furious. You know how the last chapter of Jonah ends? He is furious. He begs God to kill him because the last thing that Jonah wanted was the conversion of Nineveh. But Jesus said, the men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and they will condemn it. Because the word of God in the recalcitrant mouth of the prophet Jonah brought them to repenting knees and believing hearts. And the generation of Christ had God himself in human form 
in their midst. And they rejected. They abused. They denied. They accused. There's more to this story. Thinking about the case study of revival. God delights to give revival. The the magnitude of the sin of the subjects of revival appears to be in history to never be a disqualifier. If anything, as we trace the history of revivals, we so often learn that it's when it's when civilizations and, and cultures and societies are at their at their lowest ebb of morality that God sends grace. So that all the more the glory would be unquestionably his. There's more to this story. I would be a I would be a poor historian tonight, let alone a teacher and preacher of the gospel. If we didn't follow up with the very subsequent part of this story, I told you earlier to to, to do your best to remember a small, fairly undignified locale in Israel. Can anyone remember that place name that I offered you? Well, not a lot of confidence, is there? Not a lot of confidence. Does anyone want to have have a boisterous, robust go at telling me what the name is? Thank you, my wife. Ladies and gentlemen... Catering Island. A generation after Jonah had arrived in Nineveh and preached this message and brought revival, he went outside the city, he built a small makeshift shelter, and he sat there hoping against hope that just maybe God will still destroy the city. God didn't. Jonah's a prophet. Jonah is a prophet among prophets. Hosea and Amos and others in the generation. They already understand that Assyria will be God's weapon of judgment against them. Just one generation later. All of the prosperity, all of the economic flourishing, all of the growth of the northern kingdom will come to an end under the hand of a conqueror named Tiglath-Pileser. Don't worry, there's no test. You have to remember the name. Tiglath-Pileser strides triumphantly through the demolished village of Gath-Hefa. Neither the king, Pileser, nor the village are known by many Christians today. Tiglath-Pileser brought an immense army down, perhaps the greatest ever to have been assembled up until this time, the great force of the mighty Assyrians, to the borders of Zebulun, to conquer, vanquish, and enslave. Who? Israelites. Bodies lay strewn over the smoldering rubble. The survivors are carried away in a chain gang, forced to commence the long, grueling 700-mile walk that many will not survive. Any strong and fit young man was taken aside and with brutal, crude weaponry, he was castrated and then chained in a line and made to walk to Nineveh with the blood pouring down his legs. This is the commencement of the northern kingdom exile. This is the commencement of the promised land vomiting out the people of Israel. Times have passed. They wouldn't repent. They would not return to a state of covenantal faithfulness. They will be destroyed out of the land, violently cast away, and the land will refuse them. And even though the prophets cried out, Even though the prophets cried out the good news of God, He's faithful, He's merciful, He's kind, He'll forgive you. Just turn and repent and Yahweh will relent. And yet these prophets, tortured, slaughtered for entertainment, thrown in prison, disregarded. Yet now the Assyrians have come. And what history tells us The Metiglath-Pileser brought this unbelievably immense, indescribably cruel military force into the borders of the northern kingdom. The first village that he destroyed was Jonah's. Jonah's kids, grandkids, great-grandkids. 
Now, many historians, rightly so, and I, I, I side with them, believe that this gives explanatory power to the reluctance of the prophet. He knew it would be the Assyrians that would be God's vengeful tool and implement against northern Israel's sin. And Jonah also says right here in the text, he says in chapter 4, God, the reason why I didn't want to go is because I knew you are a kind God. I knew you're merciful. I knew you would revive them. I knew that God. In other words, Jonah had a sense of appreciation that his mission to the horrifically sinful Ninevites was to empower them, empower them, strengthening for the day of slaughter for his own family, his own village, and the entirety of the northern kingdom. There is a sense that Jonah prophetically was aware that the sun had arisen on the proverbial day of the Lord and none could prepare for the horror that it entailed. The slaughter the destruction, the rape, the pillaging, the plundering of the loot and the bodies everywhere in Gath Hefa. This Gath Hefa once been the somewhat significant yet insignificant, <laughs> admittedly, nothing like Jerusalem or Samaria, but it bore the early brunts of the Syrian advance. And this is the birthplace of Jonah of Amittai. The word for us tonight in closing. I want to turn to the chapter 4, the final chapter of Jonah's book. Jonah says in verse 3, he says, Therefore, O Lord, take my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. It's better for me to die now than live to see a strength in Nineveh and a revived people. And Jonah says in verse 2, of chapter 4, we'll close with this thought. I have zero idea of how long I've been going or how long I've got. But let's close with this verse. Jonah prayed to the Lord. I've already made reference and paraphrased this a number of times. Hear these words well. I believe this in some sense and in a very real sense is God's word to us, this conference. O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my own country? This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious God. I know that you're merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from disaster. Israel could have had that, but they refused. They rejected the prophets and refused the word of the Lord. Nineveh, no doubt out Israel 10 to 1, heeded the word of the Lord, bowed their knees in repentance, and received grace upon grace. To you and I this evening, as we meditate on where we are, our current state, what do our churches look like? What, what does our culture look like? Will we bow the knee? Will we heed the word of the Lord? Will we be as confident as Jonah that Yahweh and his son Christ Jesus the Lord represent themselves as abundant in kindness and mercy? And will we pray and ask this Lord of the harvest to commission us again as laborers in this harvest? Pray with me. Father God, we thank you so much. We thank you so much for the privilege to take your word, to study your word, to bow before your word. Lord God, we ask you to remind us tonight that none of us are masters of these scriptures, for they are the master of us. And we ask you, Lord God, to presence Christ here in our midst, that we would remember him, a living, a bleeding, a dying Savior, for us and for our sakes that we would know Him as Savior, Lord, and King. That the men of Nineveh will not be brought in to testify against us on that day of judgment. But that we will now, in the here and now, we will repent and turn to You, O Lord God of the harvest. Grant us revival, Lord God, first in our hearts, in our churches, and subsequently, 
and our culture and nation. Bless this word to us. I, I, I pray, Lord God, we would think biblically and rightly about revival. That all glory would unquestionably be yours. We ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said.